Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, well, after that I can leave because uh, you've been told pretty much everything <laughs> about me and about Wendy. So uh, um, anyway, thanks for coming tonight on uh, a winter night. Uh, we will going to talk about wind, as you probably figure out. I've done, I've been involved in wind in many ways for, uh, and in many languages, I guess. Um, which I don't, no, none of them, I, I, I don't master them, so it's just okay. Um, so we, um, I, I titled this the yin and yang of wind because uh, wind, as anything else, has uh, bad things and good things, and none of them are really bad or, or good, and uh, it's important for us to learn which are the bad things to mitigate them, learn which are the good things to enhance them. But before we go into uh, talking about those two aspects, I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, wind is invisible. So uh, basically, we have to make it visible in one way or another. And we, uh, we do things differently. For instance, an artist, this is a vision that an artist has about uh, wind. And it's very colorful. So the, the artist throws color at the wind to make it visible. And you can imagine, I can imagine, just looking at that many things about the wind, I can imagine that the colors are related to different temperatures in the wind, but that's very prosaic because I'm an engineer. Or you can imagine there's some movement that uh, comes with the wind. So I will uh, go through more seeing of the wind. For instance, what you have on the left-hand side here is uh, how the meteorologists they actually look at the wind. This is... Uh, a uh, picture from the satellite of uh, a pair of typhoons that they are forming right now in front of you somewhere in the Sea of the Philippines. So that's another way of looking at the wind, which is uh, the way the meteorologists do. So I'm, I'm using that slide just to talk about what I'm going to talk about. So uh, we'll see the wind a little bit and afterwards we'll uh, start with the in part of the wind, the wind and uh, see how we can protect ourselves and protect the structures and everything from wind. So we're going to talk about wind resilience. Uh, afterwards we'll move towards the young part of the wind, the good part, the better part of wind, and talk a little bit about wind energy uh, and wind related urban sustainability. Um, once we are done with the yin and yang, I will certainly use the occasion to introduce you to what has been done at Western in wind research for the last uh, 50 something years. Uh, there is a long tradition in wind research at Western and finally I'll introduce you to the next generation of facility that we are building right now which is the, the Windy Dome. So I showed you the beautiful way in which uh, artists, uh, they look at the wind, uh, throwing painting. I showed you the very interesting way in which meteorologists, they look at the wind. And this is a very, very engineering way of looking at the wind. We just look at the wind as, a, as we look at a time series. So we look at the variation of the velocity as a function of time. We've been all, all, always accused that we don't have imagination and we, we keep demonstrating that all the time. So that's basically what we engineers see out of the wind. But if you look at that signal, you, you see a couple of things. You see that wind is very gusty, which means it's turbulent. Uh, so it's not constant. It doesn't ever blow at a constant velocity. Even if you can actually measure an average wind speed over anywhere in between 10 minutes and one hour, wind in general is turbulent and gusty. And that gustiness and turbulence has good parts and bad parts. So the bad parts are related to whatever it does to structures, to any type of structure. Those, those uh, fluctuations that you see there, they actually bombard the structure in this way. So they excite the structure, they produce sometimes resonance of the structures and they finally destroy them. And that happens to bridges, happens to transmission towers, happens to houses, happens to wind turbines, happens to anything that we build. Um, the same gustiness is actually uh, bad for wind energy as well, because uh, we would like the wind to be constant as, a, as opposed to being uh, gusty like that. That gustiness I, I actually produces fluctuations in the energy extract of a wind turbine, which afterwards has to be 
uh, assimilated in the grid and it produces actually resonances in the grid and things like that. So it's something that has to be tempered. Uh, I should give you a good example about what that gustiness and turbulence does. Um, uh, many of the best fluid mechanicists in the world are smokers. So if you've been a smoker in, when you were younger or you're still a smoker, it's from the fluid mechanics point of view is not a bad thing because that's another way to actually see the wind. Um, but let's say you're a smoker or you're a stack and you uh, smoke. Right? You put smoke in, in the atmosphere up to the very end. If the wind wouldn't be like that, wouldn't be gusty, the smoke will be concentrated in a very, very thin lamina. And when it will impact my neighbor or it will impact the ground, uh, if we're talking about smoke coming from, from a stack, it will be very, very concentrated, so therefore damaging. But that gustiness in the wind disperses the concentration in the wind. And that's, see, that's a good thing up to the very end. So uh, I'm going to plunge in the first part, which is uh, wind resilience. Um, and you have a dramatic picture here of uh, a tornado, which is actually attacking Miami. And you're used to, if Miami, to hear about Miami, that it's exposed to hurricane winds. Uh, uh, it is exposed to tornadoes as well. So one of the jokes that I will repeatedly use tonight is, uh, uh, I'm glad you're here and you're not in Miami at this point. <laughs> And I'll try to convince you as we go through the presentation that it's a good choice being here and not in Miami. Um, so uh, those tornadoes in Miami, they are sometimes, they're coming from the ocean. They are sometimes embedded in the hurricanes. And they do, they can produce some damage. So talking about resilience, uh, just because it is called a lecture, I have to teach something. I, uh, I will tell you that uh, the problem of resilience, wind resilience, is a problem of uh, minimizing vulnerability of a building of a community to wind events. This vulnerability is a function itself, uh, it's a function of two parameters, which one is the incidence, which is uh, the, the type of storm that is coming upon you, and the other one is exposure, is how exposed we are as a community to that wind event. If you really want to know more, the intensity can be split afterwards in other things, in other parameters, one of them being intensity, which basically means the wind speed, the maximum wind speed, occurrence, which means where the storm are happening, and frequency, which means how often they actually happen. The exposure is a, is a function of three Ps, which is population. The more population in an area which is prone to wind events, the more exposed you are. Uh, it's a function of property. The more property you have in an area, the more you're going to lose. And uh, it is a function of preparedness. The, the better you are prepared for that, the better you are prepared to evacuate, or the better you are prepared to build against the wind, you are better off. I'm not going to talk too much about exposure. I'm going to I'm going to tackle a little bit the uh, in, in incidence parameters, where I'm giving you some examples. Uh, so the first factor being uh, intensity. Um, I'm going to talk about the two type of extreme events, which are hurricanes and and tornadoes. And on the left hand side. Uh, you have what we call the Sapphire Simpson hurricane scale that, that categorizes hurricanes from Cat 1 to Cat 5. And you see that on the left hand side you have the wind speed, the maximum wind speed in those events correlated with the with category and on the right hand side you have the uh, damage level. So the, if you have Cat 5 is the most damaging and uh, it corresponds to winds of over 156 miles per hour. On the right hand side you have a similar thing which is done for, for tornadoes. That is called a Fujita scale and it classifies basically tornadoes based on damage. So it's a forensic scale but it associates the damage with some wind speeds. How this is done people they know that a typical a uh, street sign will crack at a certain wind speed, at a certain type of tree 
will ban at a certain wind speed. So after, when they do damage survey, they will know pretty much what is the maximum wind speed that happened in, 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 the, in the area. And you see that we're talking, there are two Fujita scales. One is the original one, and one is a modified one, which is called the enhanced Fujita scale, which was introduced uh, more recently to take better, to, it builds a better correlation in between damage and wind speed. Now, when you look at uh, hurricanes compared to tornadoes, you see that the cats in hurricanes and the Fujita scales in tornadoes, they pretty much correspond. I mean, there are differences. I don't want to go into the details of that. But the wind speeds, they are pretty much in the same, in the same range for different uh, um, hurricane cat, uh, cats and different tornado Fujita scales. So one interesting question is, the, the damage from a hurricane is very different from a damage from a tornado, but the, the wind speeds are not very different. They're, they're quite similar. So it's actually the shape, the dynamics of the hurricane, which is a large uh, scale storm system, and the shape and the dynamics of a tornado that actually make the difference. And we'll talk a little bit about this more. So that's about intensity. Occurrence, I, I guess you know that uh, hurricanes, they really like the coastal region. They go anywhere uh, from the Texas to the, uh, to the Gulf, to Florida, and lately they, they, they start migrating more and more towards the, the northeast part of the continent. And uh, uh, you had the, the last example a couple of weeks ago that actually hit uh, New York and New Jersey, which is very much up compared to their normal trajectories. Um, on the tornado side, we... Um, there's no point. Ah, I can use it. So on the tornado side, the, the very well-known uh, tornado alley is situated somewhere in mid-America. Uh, basically, the tornadoes, they form because of um, uh, dry air coming over the Rockies and colder air coming over the Rockies and hot and, and moist air, which is coming from the Gulf. They collide and they form all kinds of systems that ultimately they, they become, thank you. Now I have my two hands occupied. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything. Is this one? Oh, perfect. Um, now what's probably new to many of you is that there is another alley which is lovely called Dixie Alley because it actually is originated be somewhere in between Mississippi and, and Florida. Uh, it's uh, less known, but it's related to the tornado that I showed you before, the one that came over Miami. So here is another reason, a very strong reason, why you shouldn't be in Miami at this point. You would be uh, at risk because of hurricanes, but because of tornadoes as well. I'm half joking, obviously, because we are not in either tornado season or in hurricane season at this point. So, um, frequency. Um, in terms of tornadoes, it's in the, 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 those are events that they happened in 2011, which was a crazy year in terms of tornado events in, in United States. Um, now, in general, uh, you don't have too many F4 and F5 tornadoes, luckily. 95% uh, of the tornadoes are F0, F1, and F2. But I can tell you, I passed through an F1 in my life, and it's scaring enough, so uh, even if it's called just an F1. In average, there are 1,000 uh, tornadoes in US per year. In 2011, they were much more than that. Uh, and out of this average of 1,000 tornadoes, only 20 of them are of uh, uh, scale F4, Fujita 4, and Fujita 5. So the map uh, tells you the story of those three days in 2011 when tornadoes happened over 14 states in the United States. 240 tornadoes have registered, been registered, uh, and um, it, it produced lots of havoc to. Uh, uh, both property, but also in terms of people, and uh, left many people also without power in, 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 in the process. The hurricanes, uh, for instance, if you really are interested, really want to go to, to uh, Miami, still want to go to Miami, I'll tell you the following thing is that the chance of a hurricane to happen in Miami is 50% chance every 13 years. The last one, 
we are due for a big hurricane in actually Miami right now, because the last one was Andrew, and I think it was probably more than 15, 16 years ago. Um, this probability is going uh, way lower as you migrate uh, north on the east coast a little bit, for instance, in, in uh, South Carolina and everywhere in New England, the probability is close to one strong hurricanes at every 33 years. So I would like to uh, move towards um, telling the story of going from those tornadoes to the, f uh, the things that we discovered during the last 15 years that um, basically thunderstorms, which we call sometimes local storm systems, we now coin the term non-synoptic wind systems, they're actually the most damaging systems, uh, they're not the hurricanes, if I take away the coastal region of North America. So North America, if I take away the coastal region, which is mostly affected by hurricane events, inside North America, 65% uh, of the wind damage is due to local storm th systems, due to the, um, the thunderstorms that you've seen even in January this year. We had thunderstorm in London, Ontario in January, which is pretty crazy, but it happens. Um, so uh, there are thunderstorms, they have multiple manifestations, but the best well known are downbursts, which are jets of air, um, uh, very humid and uh, cold air, which is coming down from the uh, cloud base. So this is the cloud base, there is air coming down and forms those huge vortices that you see here. It's just dispersing, it's moving radially here. What is interesting about this system and about tornado, the, uh, the same thing is that the maximum wind speed, which corresponds usually with the maximum concentration of what you throw at the wind, in this case here is debris and dust, so the maximum wind speed corresponds to a maximum concentration usually, and you see it happens here at this altitude, at this height, which is pretty much in the middle of this transmission tower. Now this transmission tower, or any other structure, have never been designed to withstand a wind which has the maximum velocity at 30 meters. It is designed to uh, basically be pushed pretty much like that, monotonously. I mean, it's like I put a pillow and I push you with the pillow. This is how they are designed, because they are designed for synoptic wind systems. They are not designed for uh, downbursts or, or tornadoes. So what happens in those wind systems, that tower is going to be kicked right here and it's going to collapse, and it's going to collapse in a way which is totally unusual. And this is why we are getting interested into it, because we are called and uh, asked why are those towers, why do they collapse like that when we actually design them by the code. So a very interesting thing is that there is nothing in the code, there is nothing in the design or on anything on planet Earth for those type of wind system. And I, as I told you before, they are the majority, they produce the majority of damage in, in interior North America. They produce somehow different damage and mostly tornadoes, which we have a picture here of a real tornado. Uh, and here is a, uh, one of our numerical simulations of a tornado. We actually simulated only the funnel of the tornado, which is this part, which is here numerically simulated. Um, so I, I, I was saying that uh, basically the damage, for instance, due to a tornado is somewhat different from any other type of wind. It not only impacts the building as normal winds are doing, but produces a suction, a negative pressure, which actually sucks out everything out of the facade of the building. So what happens is that at a certain point, you end up with situations like the one on the right-hand side. You have a very well-engineered building, and this is St. John's Hospital in Joplin. And uh, it was hit by an EF5, which is the hardest tornado. The structure is standing. If you look at the structure, it's almost intact. The only damage is on the roof, where there are all kinds of things which are fixed there from, here, from the HVAC to antennas to many other things and the windows are not there. So 85% of the windows of this hospital disappeared and disappeared because of two reasons. One is the suction, so it's like a, 
a, a big hoover that comes near the building and sucks the, the windows out. And the other prob uh, uh, probable cause is actually debris. So always when you buy a real estate, as in any real estate thing, you look at your neighbor first. If his roof is going to fly, it's going to fly probably towards you some, sometime. Uh, so it's debris flying. So this combination of debris and suction, they, uh, what, what it does is that the envelope of this building is gone. Uh, water comes in, the building is a right off, even if structurally is intact. So the question that we're trying to answer right now, how do we build buildings? Why do we have to build them so strong from the frame point of view and don't pay attention to the envelope of the building? And we are in a new era of looking at buildings from a different point of view and trying to figure out how do you save the most important parts of the building. Now, the effect, the damage due to tornadoes is very different to this building compared to this tornado, which actually attacked a farmstead. And you can see that this is just an EF3 tornado. There is nothing left. So it, the damage depends on the tornado, but also depends on the type of the building exposed to the tornado. So this is a non-engineered building, essentially. This is a strongly engineered building. So uh, what do we do at Western in terms of research? Well, we generate tornadoes, and we don't have Big Windy yet, which is under construction, and I'll talk about this at the very end. Uh, but we have Mini Windy, which is a 1 over 11 scale replica of the big one, and we uh, simulate tornadoes. What you see on the left-hand side is research that happened in the 1970s, um, when there, were, there was lots of research on how you produce tornadoes. Not how you measure them more, but how you produce them. And th there was very good research, and the first step that we want to do is reproduce with windy, or mini windy in this case, what people they've done in the, in the past with their machines. Windy is a totally different machine, and you'll see why it is different. And we can, so you can see that uh, depending on this number here, which is called swell ratio, which varies a lot, you have different type of tornadoes. So it goes from a tiny one, a helicoidal one, to a multi-cell tornado here. Um, so this swell ratio is nothing else than the ratio in between the tangential velocity in the tornado and the axial velocity due to the suction in the tornado. And it's the most important fluid mechanics parameters in tornado, but it doesn't tell us anything about damage. So what we do right now is actually to correlate this ratio, which is a simple ratio in between two velocities, a fluid mechanics thing, to Fujita scale, which is a damage, which is a forensic scale. And we collect data from real tornado. We go hunting with Doppler radars, real tornadoes, and we, we try to replicate them in windy. That's exactly a piece of research that happens right now. And it's very challenging. So uh, here is an example of um, uh, here's an example of a downburst on the left-hand side in mini windy, and you can see how it bursts. Essentially, it's visualized with dry eyes. And hopefully, on the right-hand side, you'll see a moving tornado in Mini Windy, uh, which is not only spinning, but it's also moving. It's translating through the facility. Mini Windy is not really small. It's pretty much, uh, so if I take uh, one over uh, one-tenth of 40 meters, which is the size of Maxi Windy, which will be the size of Maxi Windy, it actually is the size already. Uh, this is pretty much four meters in diameter. So it's a, it's a fairly big, big, small tornado maker. So uh, we look at a tornado in terms of flow vis and we reproduce the patterns in, in, in tornadoes. We compare them with, with real tornadoes. And I'm, I'm, I let, let's move to the young part, because I, I told you many bad things about it. I told you why not to be in Miami, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, let, let's move to the better story of wind, which is part of it is related to wind energy. This is, this is a wind farm. And um, the wind farm uh, got into discussions many times from many points of view, but it actually produces energy up to the very end. Now, can we do better? Of course we can do better. So you know, let's, let's just look at it a little bit. And I, I, I'll, I can tell you that this wind farm is designed very well for the wind turbines, which are on the periphery of the wind farm. So they capture very well the wind. They will provide the, 
power output, which is the one which is expected from them. But the farm is not only the ones on the periphery. There are many wind turbines which are in the middle of the wind farm. So they are in, in the wake, as we call, or downstream from the turbines on the periphery. So there is an interference effect between wind turbines, which we don't know how to model. So the models, they cannot take this into account very well. The other thing which you can see a little bit on this picture is actually that um, as the available land in North America, for instance, and in Europe even more than that, is uh, already made available to wind farms, wind farms, they move more and more in topographic terrain, and there is a little bit of topography here. And the models that we use at this point, they do not take very well into account th those effects. They do not take into account forestry effects. Um, not talking about many other issues that, that need, need to be addressed. So there is lots of work to be done in wind energy, even if it matures at this point. So here are a couple of things that we are doing at Western. Um, we look at the airfoils of the wind turbines and we, uh, we look at the blades of the wind turbines and we try to optimize them from an aerodynamic point of view. So one of the things that happens with those blades, you have an example here, it's a ginormous blade, mostly when you compare it with me and not with my colleague here. Um, the blade comes from a nice airfoil, it looks like an airfoil from an airplane and, and has to blend into this cylindrical shape right at the root of the rotor. And the transition here is, becomes uglier and uglier in shape in aerodynamics. So that's a part that we are trying to address. Um, there are all kind of airfoils which are ca called blunt. I, we can call them ugly airfoils. Uh, those airfoils, they produce vortices and we're coming with measures actually to mitigate that vortices. They produce vibrations and many other things. We are looking at uh, the entire rotor and uh, we are looking at how do we scale a rotor from the real one to the one that we can put in the wind tunnel or the one that we can put in windy. That's not yet understood, we're working on that. We are working on the optimization of wind farms, what I mentioned before, how you position them. We all put, everybody puts the wind farms in, in an array, which is a regular array. Why do we put them like that? The, the wind doesn't listen to that array. The, 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 you can optimize the wind farm and it, it will look totally different from what it looks right now. And it will extract much more energy. I talked about topographic uh, terrain and forestry. Another thing that happens to wind turbines, sometimes they're affected by wind. So they die by wind. And that's another thing that we're looking very seriously at. Um, for the ones that are very, very keen to learn about wind turbines and wakes, wake is the region behind the wind turbine, which is in interesting because it's the region where the wind turbines may interfere. This is what happens. There are helicoidal, helicoidal vortices that they form. So when the blade is passing through the air, it's forming a vortex there, which is pushed backwards, but it also rotates with the blade. So it's producing a helical type of motion which is actually responsible to all the things that they happen on that blade. Vibrations, turbulence, vortices, everything is concentrated in that vortex area. And we are exploring that. We, we, we have done some very pushy experiments with particle image velocimetry. Ask me afterwards what that means. Uh, and we can actually study the flow field exactly what the flow field does in the back of a wind turbine, helping actually people that they do modeling afterwards. We uh, looked at the other thing, which is topography. And uh, here's an example. Here's the PI. Uh, and we have a small, relatively small wind farm that sits on a very, very shallow uh, ridge here. So there is a ridge here that is not, is not very. When we build the model in the wind tunnel, which is this one here, and I look first at the model, I'm like, where is the topography? So there was just, it's just a little bit of topography. And we, we studied this in the wind tunnel, and this is work which is done right now, and we figure out that where you have mild topography, the forest covering of the land plays a very important role into the whole thing. And so we plunge in other studies which are related, how do you model uh, forest in wind tunnels? How do you model forest numerically for the models? So let's move from wind energy 
to uh, its younger sister, which is uh, wind urban sustainability. So this is, uh, if you've been in Toronto, coming from Toronto, or will be in Toronto, this is what you're gonna see. And if you look on the right-hand side from this photograph, you will see even more development. Toronto is booming right now, and uh, the wind is looking at Toronto pretty much as we look at this picture. So it's coming upon it from the lake, and it's gonna bombard all, the, all those structures, buildings, and it's gonna produce some damage if it's a strong wind. But if it's a kind wind, strong but kind, uh, it can produce energy for those buildings. And I will, I will show you that we don't know too much about that and not, not too much of that is actually explored. Uh, so the difference in between the extraction of wind and a wind farm, which is usually in flat terrain somewhere out of the cities, is that the the wind in cities is very complex, it's very turbulent. It's even more turbulent compared to the time series that I, that I showed you before. So it's very bumpy. Um, it's very bumpy and it, because of the, the buildings is actually the mean wind speed is decreasing. So they're, they're not good news for extracting wind energy. So we cannot essentially extract the wind energy from cities with the same type of wind turbines so, uh, that we use in farms. So we have to invent something which is new, wind turbines which are robust, which they take the buffeting and the, the gustiness of the wind, and they don't get damaged in the process, because if they get damaged, they can become one of those projectiles that they go into another building. Uh, and they also have to be agile, they have to start at lower wind speeds, so they are totally different animals, and that's one, one piece of research that needs to be done. In the future, and I will try to convince you more about this, and we're coming back to the envelope of the building, we only used to capture at this point only the roof of the buildings, but we have the entire surface of the building that we can extract energy out of it, and power in general is proportional with the area. So if we look at very simple concepts here, this is where we are right now. We have roofs and we put on roofs those uh, small wind turbines, small uh, solar panels, and we only use this area of the building, which is very little area compared to the total area of the building. And the devices themselves are pretty much at the beginning, are pretty much close to Mickey Mouse devices from what they have to be. Now, in the near future, we will start to extract energy, both solar and wind, from the entire area of the building. So, for instance, we have some examples that are blooming right there. We are in Chicago here, a building which actually extracts energy through vertical axis wind turbines in the corner of the building where the vortices will actually form, which is a great idea, which is a good idea. And it's over the entire edge of the building. Uh, and probably wh where we will evolve, we will evolve in simple concepts such as this one, terrace concept, in which we combine all forms of energy, solar, wind, in new forms, and even green space. But this is very simple, but you can combine them in this type of development, which is a very futuristic development, which can extract solar locally, but can extract wind over the entire development because what they created here, wind coming from the ocean, is actually seeing a wind tunnel. So it's accelerating, and can extract energy out of it. So we are moving towards integration of all those forms of energy. I, don't let me make you believe that wind is gonna solve everything, it's not. It's gonna go hand in hand with solar, it's gonna go hand in hand with other forms of energy up to the very end. As an example of what we're looking at, so this is, uh, I don't know if you know, that we, uh, Toronto is going to host the Pan Am Games in uh, 2015, if I'm not wrong. And there is a Pan Am village that is going to uh, come up there, which is situated right here. This is the island airport, the Toronto Island Airport right here. So it's in a windy position. So we looked at it and we tried to figure out there is any chance you can extract wind and make, it use, uh, make, make use of it for this development. We've done this numerically because we don't have big wind yet, so we, we started playing with it and uh, we basically looked at the available wind power, so the potential wind power, at different locations. So you can see that at the top of some of those buildings and even somewhere here there are some canyon effects 
the potential of the wind power is uh, pretty much 30 to 60 percent of the needs of that building. This is what that percentage represents. And we said, oh, that's great. So you, you actually have wind there to cover 60 percent of the needs of that building. That's fantastic. And afterwards, we looked at the devices which are now available on the market, the best of them, and we put them numerically there, virtually there, and let them spin numerically and produce energy. And guess what? We figure out that they only extract somewhere between 4 and 8 percent out of the total available, out of the total needs of that building. We've been conservative, we only put one device there, but it's still a long way in between what is available in the wind and what that wind turbine actually extracts. And I'm going to show you why that is. This is the wind turbine uh, that we used. It's the best. We chose the best for the conditions, the wind conditions that we have. And we, um, we didn't do a very good job. And the reason is this one. This is wind power um, in, in the wind, available in the wind as a function of wind speed. You can see that it peaks somewhere around four meters per second in an urban environment. This is the wind, the power curve of the wind turbine, of this wind turbine. So this is what the wind turbine can produce. And you can see that the wind turbine actually peaks somewhere around 14 meters per second. So they are not correlated. So basically, the, that peak starts not very um, early and it provides maximum energy where the, the wind actually doesn't provide energy. So there's a decoupling here which needs to be addressed. And that's one thing that we are starting to work on. So we need new type of urban wind turbine. <coughs> so with this, I'm going to have some water. And. Um, only because it's a Western event, we'll, we'll talk about Western. So um, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit the story of uh, wind research at Western. Uh, and we'll see the tradition there. So um, uh, things started in, in around 1960s. Uh, basically, it started with a huge project, uh, which is the World Trade Centers. Uh, it's the first time. So this is a a model of the World Trade Centers in, in a wind tunnel which was not prepared for wind engineering purposes is the wind tunnel at Colorado State University. Um, and it's the first time that actually engineers, they realized that if you are outside of an earthquake region, the most important load on buildings, tall buildings, is actually wind. So they looked at each other and said, we don't know anything about it. How, how are you going to take this into, into consideration? So they discovered Alan, Alan Davenport, uh, who is the founder director of the present Boundary Layer Wind Town Laboratory at Western. They discovered him somewhere at Bristol at the conference. They picked him up from the conference, brought him to, to New York, and made him the first wind engineer, essentially. They said, you have to solve the problem. How do we account for wind? So with a big, big project like that, everything goes fast. And you, you can just imagine that the only, the only mistake that was, was made during this project is that those people that were looking at wind, they were not looking at other type of attacks. And actually, Alan has been involved in the aftermath of the 9-11 to see how the building was built and how that whole thing can propagate inside, even if he was not a terrorist attack specialist. He was a wind engineer on the project. So afterwards, um, um, let's go one slide. Afterwards, uh, Alan came to Western, and when I came to Western, my first question was, Alan, why at Western? And he answered very quickly and uh, very clearly. He said, Western provided the funding. So he came to Western, he got funding from here, and he built the first wind tunnel at Western, which is this one here. It's still at Western. Uh, it's an open secret wind tunnel. It does, really still does the work. It's used now by graduate students. That was 1962, when they started working on that. Uh, in 1986, this new wind tunnel, which is still the state of the art in wind engineering around the world, has been built at Western. And this is the present boundary layer wind tunnel. We call it BLW2, to differentiate it from the old one. 
And it does, it's a very versatile wind tunnel. And um, I was talking to somebody who is interested in testing boats. We can do everything. I mean, um, it has one fan here. The wind is coming from right to left. It's recirculating on the other side. Uh, it can test bridges and, and things here. It can test buildings, model of buildings here. On the other side, it has a water tank, which is 40 meters in length. Uh, and we have done uh, Canada One, we were talking about it. We can done, we've done boats, we've done resuspension of th things which are really exotic as opposed to the typical wind engineering structures. But it's still a wind tunnel. So the wind is only blowing in one direction at constant speed. I'm wetting your appetite for, for windy a little bit. So, um, meantime, between 1960, when the first wind tunnel close to the time when the first wind tunnel was built. Up to now, we, uh, this group at Western has done lots of things. We have five decades of wind engineering. We graduated many grad students, as you see there. Many of them, are, they are basically vice president of international wind engineering or, or structure engineering firms all around the world. They make more money than the profs, which is always a good thing. <laughs> it's a positive thing. Um, and uh, we covered more than 1,500 large projects around the, the world. So when I say large project, it means something of the order of uh, 200 to 500 um, meters tall buildings and, and developments and airports and many other things. We are a small, we, the present group is a small group, is, uh, has a $3 million budget per year. It's a non-profit organization. And as I said, we, we, we've tested the tallest buildings and longest bridges in the world. You have some examples there in that picture. We've seen that. Uh, tradition of Western is to build big. I've been asked recently, what do you think is the strength of, of Western? They, we build big. So another thing that we've built related to wind is this thing which we kindly call between us the Three Little Pigs facility because it does what the Three Little Pigs were doing. <laughs> It's uh, huffing and puffing buildings. So here's a, a full-scale building, essentially, which sits in this load frame, and it's actually actuated. We have pneumatic actuators that reproduce the pressure time series that we measure in the wind tunnel. So it actuates the, the, the building exactly as the wind would do. And we look now from loading, we pass to collapse modes, and why buildings they collapse and what are the measures that need to be done. And my colleagues that are involved into that, they come with very interesting solutions. A couple of more nails at the corner of the roof will make a huge difference. So when you build something new, just count the nails. <laughs> and see if all of them are going in the, in the, in the right spot. That's a, that's a big lesson. So finally, Windy. Um, it's uh, under construction, and this is an animation of what happened for the last uh, roughly one year. Uh, it's almost there, and I'm holding my finger crossed every, every day. And so what is windy? Um, it's a huge investment for Canada. So basically, um, it's, uh, it's at this point, it's more than $30 million investment by the federal government and the Ontario government through uh, uh, grants uh, given by Canada Foundation for Innovation from the federal and Ontario Research Fund from, from the province. It's a world first, which at the beginning I thought this is great. We've done something completely new, and then the, the, the older I get, I'm like, oh my God, no, nobody has built something like that. It's lots of pressure and lots of risk in something that nobody has actually built. It's a wall first because it's not a wind tunnel, so it's basically a wind dome, and I'll show you how it works. It has 106 fans, they're smaller fans, that they can produce any type of wind system. So not only blowing in one direction constantly, they can produce tornadoes, downburst, but essentially any type of wind system that we can imagine can be produced by this huge toy. It's huge. The inner chamber, the test chamber, is 25 meters in diameter. So the first reaction is when you go into that chamber, you say, wow, it's big. 
And because it's big and because it can simulate any type of wind system, we will be able to do things with it that no, nobody else can do and wind tunnels cannot do. For instance, we can put an entire city block inside this 25 meters chamber and look at all the wind effects on every one of those buildings. We can look at an entire wind farm in, in its topography all together without looking at pieces of wind farm in a small piece of topography. We can do, look at transmission towers and transmission lines, a couple of them together, and look at the interaction. We can look at solar farms, wind farms together, uh, solar panels individually, uh, small and medium wind turbines individually. The concept, uh, as I always say, because it's coming from me, can only be simple. Uh, so it's a simple thing. It's like a candy box. It's basically a hexagonal box which has lots of fans of the, on the periphery. It has actually 100 fans on the periphery. This wall alone has 60 fans. The other walls, they only have eight fans at the base. It also has some fans, bigger ones, six of them, right at the top. So because of this, we moved from one duct with one fan to a three-dimensional box with 106 fans. So you can do much more, obviously. So we can create any type of straight wind system, such as this one, but we can vary individually every one of those fans. So we can create sh what we call shear flows. Imagine you are with a car on the highway. The wind is not always coming frontally to you. Sometimes it's coming like this, and actually side winds, they create lots of havoc for that type of thing. We can create that. Not only we can do that, but we can modify in time at one hertz, which means that the frequency, at one second reaction, everyone, the, the, the way uh, those fans will actually react. So they reproduce the gustiness that you've seen in the wind signal at the very beginning, which wind tunnels cannot do. Um, now, if you couple the fans on the periphery with the fans on the top, you produ produce a suction at the top and you produce a, a twist at the base, you produce tornadoes, and you can produce different type of tornadoes, which we right now may try to, and we are successful actually, to, to match them with what real tornadoes they look like and to what real tornadoes they do, essentially. We can translate those tornadoes at realistic speed, so they can translate at two meters per second over five meters. And it's a guillotine system that does that, and every time I look at it, I'm sure they will make me sit under it when it started, because it's a long tradition in engineering, you sit under the bridge. There is no bridge, there is a guillotine there. <laughs> it's a bad name. Um, when you reverse the, the, the story here, so you inject air from the top fans and you eject air radially through the periphery, you can create that burst, the downburst that we've seen before. And again, this one can translate at two meters per second over five meters. And essentially, it's not only that. You can basically create any type of gust, any type of wind system, anything that you want to throw it. It, it actually, not only that, the fans here are reversible. There is a garage door somewhere here that opens, and we have a pod, as we call it, outside, where we test full-scale objects and where we will do all the dirty things. I refuse to bring water inside. Uh, when, when, when you create a monster like that, people, they start throwing at you. So when, when are you going to put rain into it? And when are you going to put snow into it? And when are you going to put that into it? And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to put any one of those things in. We're going to put them outside. So the, this, this whole wall of wind, it actually reverses, the fan reverse, they blow outside, and this is where we're going to do the, the dusty, the snowy, the rainy stuff. Uh, we'll put full-scale solar panels there to be tested, et cetera, et cetera. So from the concept, uh, we moved to serious things. Uh, we uh, hired one of the, the best well-known Canadian company that builds wind tunnels all around the world. It's called Iolos. It's based in Toronto. They build for BMW, Mercedes-Benz, uh, and the national uh, research facilities in the United States. So uh, we had to train them that we cannot, we are not building here at Mercedes-Benz, we are building um, a Ford. <laughs> we cannot afford the Mercedes-Benz, we can afford a Ford. And there was a long lesson, teach people that are used to build Mercedes-Benz how you can compromise. Please compromise. We are happy if you compromise. 
It's a very interesting thing when you think Chevy or Mercedes and you want to downgrade. And it's fine to do that because we're a university, we're not, we're not. It's a big grant, but it's still uh, relatively small. Uh, the installed power will be 1.5 megawatt in all those fans. We'll never use it all, but the maximum will use half of it because if you looked at the conceptual thing before, this thing operates essentially in two modes, either in a straight mode or in an axisymmetric mode. And if you look at the number of fans which are involved into the two modes, they're pretty much the same power. So it's pretty much 50-50. So it's not, we're not going to take too much energy out of the grid. There was a time when I was thinking we can put some energy back into the grid. But doing that, it would have cost us so much that we, we, we decided we'll put it through the research that we do, as opposed to putting it physically back. There are 106 fans. Um, everything is loaded. The test chamber is at, at the upper level. So uh, everything gets loaded um, underneath, goes through a, a lift and turntable here. And this is where the test chamber is. You can see the, the fans on the walls here. Uh, those are radiators, actually, because we produce 1.5 megawatt, which is always heat. And you have to get rid of that heat. We do use that heat back in our heating system. So we do some, we take some of that energy back for us. But we could have had an Olympic swimming pool at the AMP where this is going uh, and heat it in winter, essentially, with the, with the power coming from it. Um, we can create those storm systems that I was talking before. They will be the largest ever seen made in a lab. It's five meters in diameter tornadoes that they run above your head at two meters per second. Um, and we do that because, not because we like that, that, because this is the minimum scale that we actually can put models in all those situations that we, we, I, I mentioned before. So that's the engineering design. A uh, couple of uh, timelines. Uh, this project was funded in 2009. When I look at 2009, and we are already 2013. Um, we, the design has been completed, completed by the end of uh, December, uh, by the end of 2010. We created an institute on the top of the facility to bring in people, researchers, and many other things that I will talk in one second. You, you, you cannot just build a facility and not bring people to it. It's like having the toy and not having the kids to, to play with. So the toy is not used. It's like, it just looks good in the middle of, uh, of nowhere in this case. Um, the construction started in September 2011. Uh, I still, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm full of hopes and I, I think we're going to be what we call research ready by September 2013. The construction will probably be done by somewhere April, May, and afterwards we, do, we go through commissioning, whatever commissioning can mean for something that has never been built before. It's basically we invent our own commissioning. We invent our own criteria. I'm right now. <laughs> so um, it's not going to be located on campus. Uh, we um, Western took Windy and uh, uh, used it with um, a partner with the City of London and with Farnshaw College, and the city gave us 25 acres of land. Um, and this is basically. But the, the 401 is somewhere here. So this is how you come to London. It's going to be pretty much the first thing that you see. This is Veteran Memorials. It's right here. And this here is Bradley. And this is called the AMP, Advanced Manufacturing Park. And this is where Windy is built right now. So again, it's uh, a Veteran Memorial and Bradley. Um, this is all this park. This is under construction. There is a Fraunhofer center that is already built, even if they started building after us, but it's a, it's a simpler building. I'm not jealous. <laughs> uh, there will be other buildings coming on. So it's an industrial research park that I think it's going to change a little bit the, the research, the way we do research at Western. Um, we are uh, very well connected at the Canadian scale. We've been actually, um, even if we are not built yet, sorry, we've been declared by the uh, 
Wind Energy Strategic Network of Canada is a national research facility which serves the network. What is a network? We have 16 universities from eight provinces and uh, 39, though it's more than that, uh, profs and all their grad students where they do research in wind energy in Canada. And uh, you see where they are and uh, you see what this network is actually doing. So wind is going to serve as the physical facility for the network and for everything that is done in wind energy on one side only. We created the, uh, the institute and the first thing is you have to start attracting people to come in. You start to attract projects to come in and I, I've been traveling for the last one and a half years everywhere and, and people, they look where I've been, say, oh, I've been in Germany, you've been in France. I said, I haven't seen anything. I was just on the highway. Yes, I do. I, I went in Germany at 200 kilometers per hour on the highway with my dean inside. <laughs> So the, the other researcher that was with us, uh, the next day he, he gently took the keys from me and said, Corey, I'm just going to drive today. And I said, well, why? I'm, I'm okay, Eve. I, I, I can't drive. He said, no, no, you're tired. You speak to your dean a little bit. I, oh, I'm going to drive. <laughs> and after a couple of tries, I figure out that he doesn't trust me. <laughs> So we, we've, we've started all kind of collaboration. We sign collaboration documents with all those things that you see here from the Americas, from Asia, from the European Union. The idea here is to open this. Th this, this is a huge investment for Canada. We, we, I'm not going to hold it for me. We shouldn't hold it for Western. We shouldn't even hold it for Canada. We should open it to the entire world. And people, they will come in, and this is what we hope, and they will do research here, bringing resources, and, and, and make it an, an international facility up to the very end. Uh, and that's it. And if you think that I've done this all alone, you're totally, totally, absolutely wrong. Those are only the people that they helped in building the Mini Windy, which is what you see in the back, the 1 over 11 scale. This is the team that built that. So you can just imagine the, uh, the number of people that they, they are involved in building the, the, the Big Windy. Every department at Western has been involved in one or another. Uh, many people in the city of London, we, uh, you, you, you see that we've got $30 million. We are returning all that dollar essentially to the community. The designer is in Toronto. The, uh, the general uh, contractor is Tonda, which is London, Ontario based. The steel manufacturer is Lordon, London, Ontario based. Um, the uh, provider of the fans and all the electrical thing is basically ABB Canada, based in Montreal and other parts in Canada. So I, I just looked at the picture, I don't have it here, of where we put those $30 million and it's 95% of it, it actually stays in Canada and it goes towards different industries and trades. There are very few things that we contract from outside, so uh, this is it, thank you. <laughs>